All right. Hi, Heather. Welcome to Everybody Pulls the Tarp. Heather O'Reilly, welcome to the show. Hi, guys. And hi, Moishi. Moishi from science class. That's what I know you better as. I can't even call you Andrew. Moishi, great face. Moishi from science class. We're going we're gonna to get into that and set that all up for the, uh, for the listeners. My guest today is Heather O'Reilly, three-time gold medalist, World Cup champion, and probably uh, the most famous person to ever walk out of East Brunswick, New Jersey. What do you think of that, Heather? Where are you on the, the Mount Rushmore of East Brunswick, New Jersey? I think I definitely make the Mount Rushmore. Um, I don't know. We had a few. We had a few, like, C-list Hollywood stars come through and a, a few athletes that did some good stuff. Uh, but I think, you know, without being arrogant, I do think that I probably make the Mount Rushmore of East Brunswick. I don't know. You, you tell me. I don't want. I don't want to talk about myself in that regard. Um, well, I would, you've I would always been. There. You've always been humble, Heather. So yes, I'll tell you. I think you make the Mount Rushmore of East Brunswick, New Jersey. And if 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 folks haven't caught on yet, Heather and I go way back. Heather and I uh, spent time together at East Brunswick High School. Uh, we grew up in East Brunswick, New Jersey. We were high school science classmates. You know, Heather, as successful as she has been on the soccer field, and we'll get into all that, Heather was also incredibly successful in, in science, carrying me through high school chemistry while also um, doubling as a, a, a rookie for the U.S. women's national team. So, Heather, first off, I have to thank you for, uh, for all that. But I also want to thank you, Heather. I'm so sore, Moishi, from carrying you for so many years. I know, I know. After all these years, I owe you part of my diploma. Uh, well... Heather, this is, this, is, this is special for me to be sitting down with you for many reasons, but one of which is this is the 50th episode of the Everybody Pulls the Tarp podcast. I've gone on this long journey to interview Olympians, pro athletes, CEOs, elite coaches, best-selling authors, musicians, high performers from all walks of life, inspirational people with inspirational stories to uncover the secrets to success. We've talked about leadership. We've talked about work ethic, teamwork, all, 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 all of those things. And throughout this journey, people have asked me, uh, it's a pretty common question I get. They say, Andrew, who was the first high performer that you've ever interviewed? And at first I needed to think about it, and then it became very clear. It was you, and it was for the, an esteemed publication called the East Brunswick High School Clarion, a newspaper that I wrote, I think, three articles for in high school, I was trying to find myself and try new hobbies. So this is like a little bit of a full circle moment. When I got to, you know, episode 25, 30, I said, if I can get to 50 or 100, we're going to save a seat for Heather and we're going to circle back uh, to your story. So so thank you for, for um, spending some time with me today. Yeah, no problem. I'm happy to be here. And uh, yeah, what an, I've had an incredible journey, but so have you, Moishi, from from being a, a, a sparse contributor to the high school newspaper. So now uh, lining up some, some really big stars. So congratulations to you. Well, the Moishi thing, before we get into the, the, the guts of our conversation, I, I guess that goes back to our high school chemistry teacher who, you know, he obviously saw my last name was Moses and, and he started calling me, me Moish or Moishi. You, you, you're the only one who still, who still calls me Moishi. So it's a badge of honor. I'm I'm forever proud of the the Moishi, and uh, and I'll never forget that high school science with the uh, with the the budding star that was Heather O'Reilly. So let's get let's get into it. So three gold medals, a World Cup championship. You've won at seemingly every level, everything you've touched. It seems like you know you've won championships and you've been around some some tremendous teammates. Moishi, this this pod might get an Emmy award. Uh, well, I think it will. I think it will. We're, we're, uh, we're, we're right there. So, so when you think about it and you go back to that call up to the national team, as when you think about it, can you believe that it's 19 years ago, over 19 years ago? No, that is crazy. Um, it definitely, yeah, it was a long time ago. I mean, early two thousands, essentially that I started to play very elite soccer. I mean, I played you know, I've played soccer since I was four years old and I'm 36 years old now. Um, so let's just call it 30 years of playing the game. But as you know, Andrew, because I was called up at, at such a young age as a teenager, um, I have been involved at sort of the tip top level, the pretty elite level 
um, for the last 20 years. And like you said, it does, uh, it does kind of go by so quickly. Um, I know that's like so cliche to say, but especially for athletes, because I think that we view our journey, um, especially with soccer in these like four year cycles that like revolve around the Olympics and the world cup. So all of a sudden four years is gone then eight years is gone and 12 years is gone. Um, and before you know it, you're like in your mid thirties and, and it's time to wrap it up. So, uh, it's been, a, it's been a blur, but what a heck of a journey. And, um, if you would have told that seatmate of yours and that science lab, uh, that I would have you know, done what I did, um, I would be really, really proud of her. And, uh, it wasn't always easy. There's some, you know, s you know, serious highs and lows of, of that journey, but, um, but mostly, mostly good stuff. So I can't complain too much. So, so when, when you go back to that moment, I, I actually remember, I remember, you know, I don't remember all the specifics, but I think it was 2002. Um, it was 2002 and you come into class and you say to me, we're working, we're working on science projects together at that point. And I stink at science. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I really need your help. And you say, Moish, Moish. <laughs> um, so one of the, one of the women on the national team got hurt and they called me up and I'm going to be gone a few weeks. I'm going to go play with the national team. And I ask you, oh, who got hurt? And you say, well, you probably have never heard of her. And humble Heather, like you are, I say, no, come on, just tell me. And you say, it's Mia Hamm. And I, I think that just, I think that just speaks to, you know, how humble you are, right? You know, I think at that point, if I recall, like, I don't even think it was all happening so fast for you. I'm not sure you understood kind of the enormity of the situation and the path that it would it would it would set you on. So so what are you what are you thinking about as you're getting ready to 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 join the national team for the first time as I guess a 17 year old was it? Yeah, I was 17. Um, well, I think I assume that a lot of athletes can agree with this that I think when you are so young and you are so naive and you're just like taking it in it's actually quite a bit easier, I think, than when you're older because you have no idea of the magnitude. I think that you're totally right, Moishi. I don't think that I re really grasped um, how big of uh, a thing this was. It was also a little bit of a different time with, you know, a lack of social media and, and you know, Mia was very famous, but there was, you know, some real droughts, I think, with visibility of women's soccer. So um, I don't think that I recognized at the time how big it was. But I do remember, like, it was it, it was in a time where that Keanu Reeves movie was just coming out called The Replacements. And I do remember, I don't know if it was you or some people in gym class or something, they just kept calling me The Replacement because they knew that, that it was actually Mia that got injured. Uh, and they were sort of plugging that gap. And we played the same position at that time, was like a, a striker um, before I moved to, like, midfield. Um, so yeah, people got a kick out of it that, that, that they were calling me the replacement, but, um, yeah, incredibly, um, um, that we can kind of talk to later about the fact that like I was filling in for Mia, um, in that first camp, she was only injured like briefly, but then later on. Um, when she retired, I, you know, wore her number nine for the national team for a long, long time. And it was really meaningful to me. And it was a really, um, it was a big honor, but also like, I took it really seriously. And it was big pressure, um, that I wanted to do me a proud. I wanted to fill in, uh, for her in a way that like, uh, proved people right. I don't think I'm somebody that like, really gets motivated by like proving people wrong. I can, I can do that, but I get more, um, motivation and inspiration, I think by, um, by proving people right, by feeling supported and, and, and doing great things. Um, but I did feel, uh, yeah, a little bit of pressure as a youngster to like carry that very, um, intense torch, but I'm glad that like you, uh, I was like a little bit young and oblivious at that point. I think that it actually helped me in those early days because I didn't really understand the magnitude of it all. I, I think I think I definitely was young and oblivious. But I, I think all of us who were watching you um, in high school knew you were a special talent when it comes to soccer and a, and a phenomenal person and somebody who just 
you know, exuded, you know, energy all over, you know, every, everything that you, that you touched. But I, I mean, n- nobody possibly could have forecasted what you would go on to accomplish on the soccer field in the, you know, whether it was at UNC, the, 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 the next few years, whether it was with the national team and, and your run there, or even with the club teams and all the things that you've done there. Did you feel like you were well-equipped to navigate that pressure that would continue to kind of mount? Some of it was created by your own pressure that you put on yourself, but do you feel like you were well-equipped to, to handle that pressure? Um, I think, I think that I was, I, I do owe a lot to my family. Um, who I think in hindsight helped me navigate it well, being, you know, a teenage star, I guess you can say. Um, and, and I owe them a lot. I think that they were supportive, um, but they weren't overbearing with their support. Um, you know, I, actually with the, with you being here, you can attest, like I had to like miss quite a bit of school um, when I was younger and miss, you know, I don't know, just a lot of things that you do as a, as a young teenager. And um, my parents, like, they helped me navigate that. Actually, there was a couple national team events that they, like, persuaded me to sit out because they didn't want me to, like, miss more chemistry class. And um, I think that people started to kind of be like, Mr. and Mrs. O'Reilly, like, I think that, like, she could miss chemistry class. Like, I think that she should focus on (laughs) on this. She's probably not going to be, like, a um, PhD in in the sciences. She's probably going to (laughs) be... (laughs) <laughs> a professional athlete so let's let's make sure but I think that that was just them they valued education they valued um a lot of things that uh, they knew would be grounding so I do have to give a shout out to, to my parents um and I think that uh I did have some good mentors around me some good coaches and teachers I feel like for you know from a young age I really um I without knowing it like I really surrounded myself with mentors um, that I could rely on. I mean, the, the amount of times that I've like called up various um, soccer coaches, even when I was like in my 20s, 30s, like people that I've met when I was a teenager. Um, you remember Mr. Carney, our, our uh, high school phys ed teacher, who uh, him and I still stay in touch. I don't um, call him as regularly nowadays, but he would be somebody that even, you know, 10 years ago, I would call and if things are good, if we like just won an Olympic gold medal, or if like I needed to vent about something, I'm like sniffling on the other end of the phone. Um, I did feel like I had good people around me and I don't think that I would have been equipped to do it myself by any means. Um, so I, I think that, yeah, some, some way it organically worked that I found this balance um, of being super elite, but also trying to be super normal. Um, and, and somehow that, that allowed me to just kind of, uh, grind through and, and keep, um, keep contributing at a high level and, um, stay semi-sane along the way. Do you, is, is part of that, you know, um, I've talked to so many high performers and things start to change fast, right? You know, you start to get, you know, p- people requesting your time and your attention from every different direction as you start to become more well-known, more famous, you know, whatever, whatever word you want to use. Is there something to kind of gravitating back to the people that were there for you from the beginning or before you were the big star, you know, on the global stage? It was, was there something to that? Was there comfort in that, that, that these were people that really knew the true Heather? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I never really felt like I um, had to worry about people like being – fake or using me or anything like that. I I would never really be as cynical as that, but I do think that there is like a comfort um, and a stability and like a a feeling of um, going back to your roots and foundation for, for these people that have been through um, every step of the way, because um, I don't know. I just think that they know your story. They know, when things aren't great, like what you need, or when things um, are going well, like what you would want to hear, and um, and just kind of know me as like a whole person. So I would say that like more than being cynical about like that I couldn't trust others, I just felt very inclined to to grab onto some people um, from my childhood, and I still talk to like quite a few high school friends and. Um, and, and like I said, like some of my youth soccer coaches are still like on my speed dial. 
Um, and I think that, yeah, maybe, maybe it is sort of like a throwback mentally to like times of innocence and like times that it was just like me playing soccer for fun and, and that they like loved me during that. Like when I wasn't, you know, on TV, maybe, maybe there is some kind of like subconscious, um, feeling there, but I just think that like, yeah, those, those people that have been through my journey have, have, have certainly helped me stabilize. I, I, you and I have talked about, I, I've, I've, I'm in touch, you know, somewhat regularly with Christine Lilly and Christine told me, Andrew, she said, Andrew, she said, I, I, I never want to forget what it feels like to just play soccer for the orange slices at halftime. Like that was something that I was very intentional about as I started to find more success and soccer became more serious. I never wanted to forget the enjoyment I got out of playing soccer when I just thought it was about orange slices at halftime. So I, I guess what you're saying is, is something similar there. You, you, you try to kind of, you, you continue even today to, to, to connect yourself back to the people who were around you when maybe it was simpler. Um, and it was just for the fun. I do think in soccer and especially in women's sports, I mean, let's be, let's be frank. Like there maybe is some more purity in the game. Um, just for speaking that there's just not the same kind of money. It's not the same kind of endorsements. It's not the same kind of, um, change of lifestyle. So, you know, I, I do think that, that a lot of us, a lot of my peers on the national team, Sure. Do some things come into play? She deals uh, being the, the high scorer in the World Cup. Yeah, things like that do, of course, come into your head. But I think for the most part, near everybody's motivation is around the way that they feel about the game, the way that they feel about the sport, how it sort of lights us up to just play the sport, play the game. And, um, and so I don't think I ever really struggled with, with remembering the innocence of it all. Um, because like, once you lace up your boots and get out there, like we're all like kids again. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think that that was ever a big concern for me that I would like lose my motivation. My motivation was to help my teams win, was to like compete. I just always wanted to compete. I always wanted to win. I always wanted to like push myself physically. I feel like that was sort of my, my thing. Um, I was like a very fit player aerobically and anaerobically. I just was like a fit, fast player. I could run all day and I wanted to because I felt like that was my gift. That was my like service to the team. Um, and I found a lot of joy doing that. And I found a lot of joy competing. And um, so, yeah, I never, I never lost those things. And I mean, I don't really know if people in the NBA or, you know, in, the, in Major League Baseball, if they, if they lose their innocence, um, but I think for the most part, it, you know, with the women's national team, if you asked us what we want to do, it would be like, let's play a five side tournament with some music on like to us, that's like our, our greatest sense of joy and, um, and, and just being together as a team. And that's actually what I, um, now that I'm retired for about a year and a half, like I miss that. I miss that grind with my teammates. I'm still playing with, uh, UNC women's soccer a little bit. I sub myself into practices just so I can knock the ball around, um, but that feeling of like competition and togetherness is, is something that I, I certainly miss. So let's talk about the environment, the U.S. women's national team. So the, Christy Rampone told me that practices are tougher than the games when you're on the U.S. women's national team. Is that true? Yeah, I'd say 100 percent. I think, uh, well, you know, not this is probably going to be very um, arrogant. And if there's any Europeans that watch this, they'll probably want to punch me in the face. But um, generally, I think that for the U.S. team, I think because we have such a broad pool of athletes, I do think that like in most competitions, we could probably submit a, an A team, a B team, and potentially even a third team um, into a world event and still do pretty well with all three teams. Um, and so I say that because that just proves sort of like what the battles were like at training. Um, yeah, I just think that it's one of those like intangible things that I don't think that we really talk about, um, but it's what Mia and Christine Lilly and players like Michelle Akers, they, they just built this competitive, um, environment in like the nineties. And then just like, they passed the torch along to, to players like myself and to, to Abby Wambach and now to, you know, Alex Morgan, Rapino's carrying the torch and, 
Um, and everybody sort of did it with their own style, but the, the style is always like, we, we kick ass, we win because we know that like nothing really matters unless we win. All right. If we win our platforms bigger, we get the respect that we, um, that we want. Good things will come our way. We need to win. We need to get the job done, but we always had fun with it. Like it's a collection of people that actually, um, actually like working hard. And I think that that's, you know, the difference between an elite player and like a, just a, a good player. Like there's actually like this, you just love the grind. You love the like physical pain. You love the tenseness. You love the intensity. Um, I mean, sometimes you have to step away and like recover emotionally, but like, you know, that's, that's what it takes to like actually love and embrace that intensity because uh, when you're in like the 123rd minute against Brazil, like there's no room on that field for people that don't like that feeling. You have to like like it in like a kind of a sick way. Um, and so I think that, yeah, the intensity was so strong. So we would have these inner squad scrimmages that were like so intense. And speaking of Christine Lilly, I remember vividly when I was a young player on the team, we had like a five side tournament and her team was a lot of her, I'd call them the OGs like Mia and and a lot of players that were of her generation and they didn't do well like in the five-a-side tournament but they all lived together this was when we didn't have a professional league so we were all sort of training out in los angeles what they called the residency program so uh we all lived there for about like six months at a time so they competed together like they lost to probably like teenagers like me and uh and then they had to go home and like live together in this house and Christine told me that like, it was kind of tense, like the entire day, like at the house, they were sort of like pissed off at each other, pissed off at themselves. And it took them like a whole day to kind of regroup, shake it off. Um, and some of those women are like best as a friend. So um, that just kind of says it all in terms of like the competitive nature of it all. But um, yeah, I think that it breeds a certain kind of person. How, how does that consist? Like, how do you, how does uh, an organization like the the women's national team stay so consistent over such a long period of time? It's a great question, and it's pretty amazing. And now that I'm at the University of North Carolina, um, I kind of am seeing, and I'm around every single day, like the genesis of the women's national team. And the genesis of the women's national team is a guy actually named Anson Dorrance, who's my boss now. He's been at UNC for like 40 years. And he was the first head coach of the women's national team to win the World Cup. He actually won the World Cup with the women in 1991. And that team was like Mia when she was like a baby and Lil when she was a baby. Um, and I think early on, American soccer, like similarly on the men's side now, women's American soccer was nowhere on the map. I mean, these like these women in Europe, they were playing like Italy, Germany, they were playing. People were like, USA, women's soccer, like, it was, it was nothing. But what Anson realized was that we had really good athletes and we had women that um, embraced competition and for some reason, like, shed um, or felt comfortable shedding some, like, uh, gender norms, I guess. They didn't feel like ashamed of, of wanting to be the best, of, of having big dreams, going after it, when a lot of other women would kind of be meek or modest and, and not um, be as bold with their, with their foresight. So Anson sort of bred this competitive nature, which actually here at Carolina, we call the competitive cauldron. And what that means is essentially every single drill that we do, um, every single day, we have like managers all over the field and everybody's marking down everybody all the managers have a job and they're marking down all the stats of practice like wins losses who's winning every little shooting drill um and uh, in the old days before like just like data was like accumulated quickly it would be posted on a, a board uh at practice and so if you were so inclined which of course we all were because we were competitive you go up and kind of see where you rank and it's all a ranking system and he does this ranking system with everything from even like uh, team drafts, like say that you have some players that are chosen to, to draft their five-a-side team. Um, as a player, you could see where you were drafted. Everything's very public, very exposed, very out there. Um, and so I think that that sort of hardens you little by little, it hardens you because you can't just like, you can't just like be crippled by the fact that you were drafted 25th 
Like you got to still perform that day and prove that you can, you know, rise up again. And I think that that like that sort of uh, embracing of the intensity transferred from UNC and that sort of attitude to the U.S. national team. And I'll tell you what, Andrew, like winning breeds winning. So you do that sort of thing early on, early days, you win 91, then, you know, you win the 99 World Cup. And all of a sudden, you think of yourself, I'm a winner. I'm a badass. This program is about excellence. This program is not about third place. This program is about winning, winning first place trophies. And I think that that attitude being established early on just has been like this, like churning, churning, churning um, identity of the program. And then everybody that steps into the program, you better morph into that program because, um, yeah, you can't uh, you can't survive unless you do. So, so what's I, I, obviously you're, you're you're an assistant coach with with the program now, and it's it's kind of coming full circle for you. Um, going backwards a bit, so you know, obviously highly recruited out of high school, you know, you're, you're starting to have some success with the women's national team. You're training for the, for what would have been your first world's cup and you, you have a leg injury. Um, how did the leg injury, well, first off, you know, what was that experience like, you know, a significant setback like that. And then how did that impact your, your, the start of your career in Chapel Hill? Yeah, Moishe, I don't know if you remember, but when we were grabbing our diplomas, um, I, grabbed mine when I was on crutches. So yeah, in 2003, when I was just kind of like becoming this young superstar, uh, I was given a start in a match against Ireland to basically see if I had what it takes to make the 2003 World Cup team. And just about five minutes into that match, a ball comes in. I know it's going to be a collision with the goalkeeper, but like I, I just knew that like it was the right play for me to make. And it was um, I really wanted to make the team. So I went for it. It was actually a header. The ball bounced in the net. It was a goal. But at the same time, this Irish goalkeeper, who I actually know now, and I told her she broke my leg, um, she came in, she crushed me and, and, and broke my fibula. And, uh, oh, hilariously, Moishe, if uh, you look back on, on that game, because it's like, you know, you can find some VHS type of tape of this. Uh, it was prom season. And so there I am in my national team uniform, but I have these like long, oh, my nails are done now but these like long acrylic jersey style like nails on because it was prom and um and the camera's down on me you can see my nails but I'm crying because my leg is broken I'm in tremendous pain and I'm also crying because I know like something's not right like this is clearly a bad injury and the world cup was only about three or four months away from that from that match so it it was just kind of like a a moment of realization that like uh uh-oh like this this is probably not going to happen for me. So I was very emotional, but my nails look good. So that was good at least. Um, and yeah, that was, I think the first bout of adversity that I had in my, in my career, because at that point it was like this, this young teenager had like made these youth teams and she was called up to the senior team. And she was like making a run for the world cup. It was pretty smooth sailing for me, I would say. Um, And this was the first time I was kind of knocked on my ass a little bit and um, I couldn't will myself through it. Like I couldn't, I couldn't just get better faster. Um, And I think as a youngster that kind of like felt like I had this like enormous grit and this like willpower. I think it was the first time that I really couldn't do that and had to show maturity and patience and and just let my body heal. But it did play a mental toll on me. I think Um, I just, I think I had like a deep fear that, that I would never come back and be the same player. And, and maybe, you know, the story would be like, oh my gosh, this young superstar was like teed up to like do great things. And then it never really happened for her. She got this injury and never really happened. And I think that like, I was like building this monster in my head and said, it was just like, it was a broken fibula. It was like, not a big deal. It'd be fine in three months or so. Um, But I was, um, and maybe that was an instance where that pressure that we had spoken about earlier was kind of starting to show show a little bit. I was I was scared that I was going to maybe let people down or let down the the legacy that um, that had been building. Um, but then I get to Carolina, I get around really good people. Anson Doran's actually took me out to dinner because he could tell I was very stressed um, about my injury, and he's just like, "We got you, we got you. We're just going to take care of you week by week." and he was like, I bet by the end of the season, you're rocking and rolling, scoring goals for us. And I was like, okay, okay. And uh, and he was right. I mean, by the end of my freshman year, 
I was um, pretty much scoring a goal game and, you know, I felt like my, my speed and everything had come back. So um, yeah, that was, uh, it was my first bout of adversity that took me a little bit to, to kind of get over. And again, I did need um, a support system around me, which I think is, is really, really critical for a lot of young athletes. So this show, you and I have talked about it. It's called Everybody Pulls the Tarp. It's all based upon a philosophy that I have that great teams, great organizations are powered by individuals who contribute in unexpected ways. They do things way outside the boundaries of their job description. They lead by example. They do the little things that make uh, a big impact. You've, you've played so many roles throughout your career on the team, right? The, the, the rookie who was being mentored, the superstar who was, who was the, 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 one of the faces of the team and, and doing the mentoring um, you know, and, 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 and now you're, you're, you're coaching, you're, you're a huge ambassador for the game. Talk about that for a bit. How, how did your mindset shift as you were kind of going through the, those, those different cycles, if you will, where your role was evolving through, you know, what was an incredible, incredible playing career? Yeah, I think that you're absolutely right, Andrew, that like, I do feel like I wore so many hats with the U S team. Um, in particular, I guess we can just talk about the U S team because, it's, it is kind of like so clear how that uh, arc of, you know, a lot of athletes, you know, some, some break the mold like a Tom Brady here or there, but in general, like there is something to be said that a lot of athletes are peaking in their late 20s, 27, 28, 29. Um, and, um, and yeah, and, and, that was, and that was me as well. And I think along the way, um, there were so many instances where I was, you know, starting, coming off the bench, um, young player, middle-aged player, older player, like you said, kind of like the, the young pup that was getting mentored to like me being the old one, like mentoring somebody like Alex Morgan or, or Mallory Pugh. Um, I always remember that I was actually Alex Morgan's first roommate on, on the road because they thought that I would be good for her. Like they thought that I would be um, a good older older player to kind of show the ropes and, and tell her about like team rules and just like how things function and things like that, which I look back now as like, that was, that was like an incredible compliment that they saw that I would be like that person that would be good for, for these young players. But um, I guess I just, yeah, I, I, I had a youth coach back in the day that, um, that her name was Tracy Leon and uh, it was really formative time in my life because this was an under 19 team. So we were all like either essentially 16, 17 or 18 years old going through this like two year journey together. We wound up winning the, the inaugural under 19 youth world cup. And I think it, it, it was like on that team that I really um, learned the value of, of everybody contributing um, from it, from everything, from the equipment person to uh, the super soul goal, goal scorer to the player that was like really there for chemistry. And that, that was really important. And I'll, I'll never forget, like we had this ac acumen, um, unity, strength and attitude that was uh, for USA. And I just kind of always held on to that, that like, even when things were, I think, like you said, like getting professional or like you're getting these contracts, like there's some purity still, I think, to uh, what we were doing and how we were representing the country. So I think based on like on those early days, I learned um, no matter what role you were doing, you do it 100%. Um, no matter how sick you are that day, if you only have 80% to give on that day, like you better give 100% of your 80. <laughs> and um, yeah, and it really kind of shaped me. And uh, I just tried to be the best teammate that I could be. I knew that um, I liked playing soccer. I, I think that I probably could have been a, a pretty decent like track athlete or an ind ind uh, independent uh, individual sport athlete. And uh, I didn't because I liked a team. And um, my dad actually always tried to get me out for track because he was a track star. He ran at Villanova University and I had a really good like fitness platform to me, but um, I didn't want to be running by myself. I wanted to be working with other people. Um, I'm very much like a believer, I guess, of everyone pulls the tarp. It's like sort of like a one plus one could equal three, could equal 50, you know? So like, let's make each other better by, um, by filling in for each other's um, holes, by elevating each other. And um, I, I just think that like, I just always really embraced that, that team environment. 
I, I mean, obviously, you and, and uh, I could ask you questions all day, Heather. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up here in a minute or two because I, I know you've got a, a, a busy schedule these days. But just just before we wrap up, I mean, like I remember, obviously, you, you're you you're during your career, you were a goal scoring machine. But I was always amazed at the selflessness, right? So it almost was like you became known for more like you became more better known for your crossing and your passing than you did for your goals. And you were a heck of a goal scorer. I mean, it just seems like that that was part of your uh, that was part of your fabric. Yeah, I think so. I think um, it was a bit of a natural evolution, I think, to my game. I mean, you know, growing up, I was a, a center forward. And like we talked about earlier, I mean, Mia gets injured. Then I, you know, fill in for her. So uh, early on, I was like an out and out goal scorer. And then around 2007, we got a new coach with the national team. And I was like doing okay at scoring goals. And, and I was definitely like making my case to to be a, a go-to starter in that role but she was just like with your physical qualities and your ability to cross the ball like I see you as an outside midfielder sort of um, winger position and she was like is this something that you would embrace and you know I, I think that like I was bummed a little bit uh, to this to this concept because what does it mean it means well you're probably scoring goals less it means you're probably in the spotlight a little bit less you're more of the provider you're more of the like the Robin and the other people are the Batman. Um, but I, you know, again, if it meant that I was out on the field, um, and getting time, like I totally was for it. And so I think that like, yeah, I really did make that my, my craft for a long time. And, um, under Pia, um, I had probably my most successful years of the national team. Um, like I play, there's some stat that I played in like 70 games in a row with the national team, maybe not all starts, but essentially got into the game 70 in a row, which says a lot of things. It says one that I was a like consistent player that they believed in me that I should be on the pitch um, for the U S team for, you know, that's probably like three years of games, um, which is, you know, I look back at that stat and I don't think that I realized it when I was in that 70 games, like how amazing it was. But I look back now, I'm like, that's pretty incredible. Like t considered a top 15 player, you know, every single game, 70 games in a row for like four years. Um, I really am super proud of that. And I think that like I did, um, I was up for that like role change. And again, I think that it, it did mean that, you know, you sacrifice a little bit of like stardom and, and become a little bit of like the undercover um, person that makes it click. But, um, but again, I think that like at the end of the day, I love, I love uh, winning soccer games. And I think that like, I help teams do that along the way. So super proud of that. You, you, sh you sure know how to win soccer games. You, you also know that it's, it, your platform is, is, is so much bigger than soccer. You've had such an incredible impact, um, not just on women and young girls, but ch people, ch you know, ch children, ev everybody, you know, top to bottom. Um, you know, is a little bit better uh, for it when they watch Heather O'Reilly go about uh, go about your business. So I want to bring it full circle again. We talked about the story, um, the story that that I wrote for the East Brunswick High School paper in I guess 2002 when you took over for for Mia Hamm. And we'll we'll end here. I I, I dug up an old tweet from a few years ago in 2016. Uh, I guess it was your retirement from your international career. Mia tweets, "Congrats, Heather O'Reilly, on an amazing career." Thank you for representing us with such class, grit, and persistence. Legend! Exclamation point. Before we go, what does that feel like, right? To be ah, the person. I cried, Moishi. Uh, it was unbelievable. I think that, like, I remember reading that tweet, and it's just, yeah, it just is surreal. I think it's just super surreal when you know I was um, a young kid at the '99 World Cup. Um, that was held in the U.S. And, and one of the games was a giant stadium. So you know these people, the Barbados, Andrew, Jen and Justine Barbado. Uh, we were all on the same youth, youth soccer team. And um, we went to the game and I'm watching Mia Hamm, um, you know, do these amazing things on the pitch and scoring goals and, and winning the World Cup. And Jen and In 
And all those girls, they were being like, I want to, she thought that, that I was a legend, um, was really touching. And like I said, I think that like, I tried to do her, her proud uh, uh, whenever I wore the number nine for the US, as you can see, I got it up right here. And I just really took a lot of pride in, in trying to uh, pass that torch. And I looked to see some of the things that the US team is doing these days, you know, at the White House, uh, obviously Megan Rapinoe is making such a huge impact beyond soccer. Um, I am really touched that like I was just part of part of the long line of, of, of people that have been able to, to influence the landscape of sports. Well, Heather, all of us from that high school science class and from East Brunswick High School could tweet the same thing that Mia did. Thanks for representing us with such class, grit, persistence, an absolute legend. This has been a, a legendary uh, 30 or 40 minutes here, and we'll have to do it again sometime. Keep pulling the tarp. Thanks, Moishi.